welcome you to this afternoon's lecture. Welcome everybody. We've got, as you certainly know already because you're here, we've got Roberto Zicari with us. Uh, Roberto Zicari is Professor of Database and Information Systems at the Goethe University Frankfurt, Germany. He's an internationally recognized expert in the field of databases and big data. His interests also expand to AI in ethics, innovation, and entrepreneurship. He is the founder of the Frankfurt Big Data Lab at the Goethe University Frankfurt and the editor of the ODBMS org web portal and of the ODBMS industry watch blog. He was for the past five years a visiting professor at the Center of Entrepreneurship and Technology with the Department of Industrial Engineering and Operations Research at UC Berkeley in the US. And today he's actually addressing an issue that uh, uh, involves all our disciplines and is quite obviously of interest to many different perspectives. Um, he is talking about mindful use of AI and Z inspection, uh, a holistic and analytic process to assess ethical AI. So we look at artificial intelligence and ethics. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to cover this topic. Um, I also understand that the uh, background of the participant is a variety. So I will try to um, be as clear as possible considering that you might have different kinds of uh, background. The work that we are presenting, an initial core team that did that work and is quite interdisciplinary, not only international, but also in terms of uh, uh, affiliation we have from philosophy to computer science and in between since we have been working on AI for healthcare we have also medical doctors in our team. So what is a, uh, the whole motivation of this uh, research is really to be aware of the ethical, societal, technical and legal implication anytime we use artificial intelligence. So there's been a lot of work done recently on trying to figure it out, what are the implications on paper, but really there's been very little work on practically trying to analyze best practices or in, in real case. And in fact, if you consider, that's a quote from an interesting paper, if you consider the impact of the technology like AI is not only the software, it's affecting people directly, indirectly. So this is quite an important work to also make sure that uh, people of different disciplines become aware of that. So what is the status quo? Well, um, if we talk about ethics, one has always to consider what is your view of the world and the way we have been approaching our work is to look at the contemporary Western European democracy based on fundamental uh, rights. So the essence of a modern democracy is based on respect for others, expressed through support for fundamental human rights. There's a very interesting uh, work done by um, Professor Christopher Hodges uh, at the Oxford University that did a study in 2016 for the UK government looking at ethical business regulation. It was not uh, related to AI, but I think it's very interesting to have a look at this uh, report because it's looking at the motivation for business to, be, to behave ethically beside being legal. In Germany, the, the, the federal government has set up a so-called data two thousand eighteen with the mission to develop data 
we presented a uh, final um, findings in uh, October last year. And the paper that is actually, you can download it from here. This is actually a presentation. This is a summary of the presentation. It includes ethical guidelines and 75 concrete recommendations for acting ethically regarding to data and algorithms. It's quite interesting work. The part on data, data from different platform. Of course, you know, on the personal data, you have the GDPR. But the interesting thing for us, at least, was the part where they look also at the way you use the data. I mean, the data is there. If you don't use it, it, it doesn't do any harm. But it's when you start using it with some software, for example, AI, then, then this becomes interesting. So how you do an ethical handling of that, and in general, they look at the digital transformation and what does it mean in terms of democracy. I think it's a very interesting piece of work. For you that are in digital humanity, I strongly recommend it. And uh, this is a presentation that was a summary done last uh, semester by a series of lectures. They look at this general uh, principle, this uh, human dignity, autonomy, privacy, security, democracy, justice and solidarity and sustainability. These are uh, general ethical principles, extremely difficult to put it in practice. So what we have done, rather than following that set of principles, we've been monitoring what the European Commission has done. The European Commission, in parallel, they set up a so-called independent high-level experts group on AI. And they presented actually after one year work, well, more or less in the same time in April, 2019, ethic guidelines for what they call trustworthy AI. And this trustworthy AI, which is central for our work, uh, is based on four ethical principles rooted in fundamental rights. The first three, you are not surprised, especially some of you in, in, into ethics or in bioethics, respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness, a kind of three standard. They added a fourth one called explicability. One of the reasons why they had the explicability is because most of the time, this kind of software that is being developed, is not transparent. So you cannot really understand very well why certain prediction or certain results have been generated. So explicability becomes like an ethical principle very specific to this technology. So in reality, we are really talking about apply ethics, you know, ethics that has a, an application of a particular domain and technology in this particular case. The uh, European Union, so the expert groups, have defined what they think is a trustworthy AI. So you see, they don't use the word ethical AI, they why certain uh, results have been generated. So they have three pillars here. It has to be lawful, so respecting all applicable laws and regulation. There is no law here. There's only the law on data, so like the GDPR, but there's no law at the moment covering the use of AI. It should be ethical, so respecting ethical principle, the four one that we discussed before, and it should be robust from a technical perspective, but also taking into account the environment or the context. So they come up with uh, requirements. So in seven requirements to make an AI trustworthy. Now these requirements, you can see this is the, uh, the reference are the following. You have the first one is human agency and oversight. So they put them together. And this is really including fundamental rights, 
and also agency and oversight. So to what extent, for example, uh, we have been using um, to assess a, a medical device in healthcare and obviously um, human agency is an important aspect if I have autonomy to be able to make decision or, or not. An oversight to what extent is uh, the interaction with human beings and, and the software. So this is really, really on fundamental rights and the role of uh, the implication on people. The second requirement is very technical, you know, it's called technical robustness and safety. And it really is for software developers that need to look at to what extent this software is resilient to attack, secure, is accurate. Does it produce accurate results for all kinds of people? It's reliable and can be reproducible in case you want to do an audit. The third requirement is called privacy and data governance. And as you might see here, it has to do with data. So privacy, quality of data, access to data. This is a key because all of these systems feed on data. There's no AI without data and it's a lots of data. And the data that you feed to this machinery has to be a good quality. Otherwise the output is of bad quality, which is not a surprise. But since you know it's really difficult to figure it out when you look at the output, it's very important to um, verify the source of the data. It's like training, so it's like you know, train a, a kid. You, you different is that the whereby the a person will be able to learn and take care of the reason, the software that we have at the moment does not have the capability of making casual uh, uh, associations. So it does not really understand, it just reacts to what has been fed as example and repeats. I mean, very simply said. Now, transparency is the fourth uh, requirements. And it's interesting because transparency is not necessarily that you're always able to see the software. There might be several reasons why you can. There might be that you have an intellectual property, so you can because the vendor will not allow you, or because there's not really anything to see, because even if So I need to explain the doctor why this software is predicting that you have a a disease or not. And communication, so how you communicate with respect to what this software does, with respect to what we really is the situation. Most of the time, that's our experience, you have communication, for example, in website that are not consistent to what the software does. You know, it's, it's actually mostly done by sales or marketing on PR, and most of these people do not really know what is the software, and that's the problem. The other three are diversity, non-discrimination, fairness. Here there's been a lot of work being discussed at any level. I'm sure that even if you're not with technical background, you, you read about bias and discrimination. And basically what it means that if you use a software, for example, to uh, decide who should get the visa. So for example, there's some application for people that maybe come from abroad and the, uh, the office that is uh, issuing visa decide to use a software that based upon certain information that's been fed, decide whether this person should get the visa or not. Or you could get, for example, some software that's been used for analyzing an interview and predict whether this will be a good employee or not, and makes a suggestion for hiring or getting a visa. The very uh, in incredible cases that have been uh, stated in uh, recently in the uh, press is about using AI at court in the States. So as a support tools for judging whether a, a criminal would be uh, the prediction whether this person will do another crime
the result is that the soft, the same soft for two people, Caucasian and Afro-American would be discriminating because it would be skewed in the prediction towards the class of people in an unfair treatment for uh, two device that is treating patient, for example, for screening cancer, and it works very well for certain kind of population, but when you uh, use it for different race, it, it doesn't work very well because it's been trained with that is not to software, to machine learning or deep learning. Lots of, been, lots of research has been done in this area. The sixth element is societal and environmental well-being. You see here is another area where it's no more technical at all because you including sustainability, environmental friendliness, social impact, society, and pretty important democracy. You can measure that part. You can probably measure some metrics here. You'll see in some expertise, different kind of um, attitude because you know a machine learning engineer won't be able to make a judgment whether the software that they're using is endangering democracy, for example. And the last one is accountability, low part, including auditability. So can I audit something? And basically uh, look at trade-off and redress. Redress means something totally bad and you need to undo what you've done because there's a harm. You can read more in this report here. These are the requirements. Uh, sometimes in the literature, you can cluster those requirements in this way, for example, by a fairness discrimination. There are several uh, different ways of, of explaining the same term of transparency. And there are a couple of things that um, um, are interesting. So there is a big gap, and that's, I would strongly recommend you to read this report from the NAPI Foundation of January last year very interesting report, but they really, there's a gap between this principle, this requirements and putting it into practice. Practice means when I have a real case, so I have an hospital and a vendor is trying to maybe push for a, an AI solution in radiology or in any other area, is it good or bad? And this good or bad cannot be answered like a feeling. It should be kind of rooted into some kind of framework. That's why it's so important to have at least a frame and a context. Very difficult area. That's what we are trying to do. So that's why we come up with this research is a uh, not founded by anybody so that we're totally neutral. And it's basically uh, a, a process for trying to assess if in practice, a particular AI in the context is trustworthy and to what extent it is or it is not. So when we started January last year, there was no even the report of the EU. So we were kind of working like experimenting. And the way we did it was, okay, we look at some of the framework and we try by learning by doing. And in fact, we started assembling, that's the first project we did. We assess a product of a startup, German American, they had an AI for predicting cardiovascular risk. I'll, I'll tell you a couple of This is basically what we did, we've done. And with that, we learn the challenges, the difficulty, we come up with this process. Now we are working, we just started with this other um, use case, which is likely in the same area, but it's slightly different because is machine learning used as a help to recognize cardiac arrest 
which is different than, than the heart attack, by the way, in an emergency call for the city of Copenhagen. People call, they are under stress, they might die on the phone. A human being answered the phone and try to figure out by what the person is saying, whether this is serious and send an ambulance. That's normally the case. In 25% of the cases, the person does not understand that the person is really seriously uh, having a condition. So they um, actually use a software, so the hospital, It's the audio of the call, audio file of the call, turn them into text, analyze the text, and from the text, make a prediction whether the person that was speaking would have a cardiac arrest or not. And since, you know, they own the data and they have more than 20,000 audio files per year, and they knew which of this person was having really a cardiac arrest or not, they could compare how accurate was this software. So, when they did that, they did an is suggested by a software that this is a result. He might not trust this. So there is a trust issue between using deep learning, which is another kind of German Center for AI has a used neural network for classifying skin tumors as an assistant to a dermatologist. And we're gonna work with them to figure it out what is the implication if you have now some software that is telling to a dermatologist something that you might agree or might disagree. And also what is the implication of the software and all kinds. If you're interested, this is all public. You can go through the website of the inspection and, and check them out. And this is our team. You know, the, the team that does all these projects is pretty big. So many more people, but more interesting, if you look at the discipline here, you really go from philosophy to medicine, to um, computer science, uh, law, and we all distributed. So it's really, I'm pretty impressed that we were able to assemble such a big team. And the idea is we are trying to, uh, we have defined this process, which is like a, an orchestration process. So you can think of this, Think that all of these are experts. It could be an orchestra, like each one of them is very good in playing something. This playing the violin, this playing the piano, and, but no, nobody can play the whole piece of music because you require coordination. So this orchestration process is basically some kind of direction to coordinate and basically allow set of people to look at the impact of an AI from these three experts, ethical, technical, and legal. No, we'll find nobody who's expert in all, because you know, most of the time you have silos of expertise, but here you don't go out of that because you really need to coordinate and understand what different people and different teams have done. The idea is like to coordinate, if somebody is familiar with business, it's a bit like a due diligence where you are giving an assignment, due diligence normally is done in business for evaluating the business value of a company before buying. Are you doing that? Because then you could improve the software if you have a chance to work with designer or 
you can analyze the risk and basically report it to an authority, for example. Who are the stakeholders that could be interested in this work? And many. It really depends on where you are, and you could really go from developers up to user or, or policymaker or designers and NGO and you name it. This could be either part of the design. So if you are an ethics officer in a company, you could then talk to your developers or it could be done as an audit. At the moment, there's no law. So there is now a certification or a, a law that forces the idea. When you buy a fridge, you likely have a energy consumption labels. So green, the fridge does not consume a lot of energy. Uh, nobody's gonna sell you a fridge with red nowadays. But when you buy a fridge which is uh, saving energy, nobody's going to come to your house one year later to figure it out if the fridge is still consuming as the stamp has said. Because it's not meant to be because nobody did the law. But think about a car. When you have a car, at least in Germany, you have to bring the car for inspection every two years. And inspection is by law. So, and every country has its own law, but apparently somebody thought, okay, a car, I need to look at safety brakes, lights, and all of that. And this is possibly could harm people. So there's a law that forces you to bring the car every two years and, and do the, the check. Interesting thing is nobody's checking the driver. You can have a perfectly safe car that's been checked and then you drive, you, you're drunk and you kill somebody. So there's not a relationship with the context. And this is interesting because you could see other example of, for example, very complicated technology, like nuclear technology. When you want to verify if certain um, um, plant of nuclear technology are safe, also you need an assessment. Or if you want to do arm control, then you need an assessment as well. So there are all other areas in airspace or air, in, 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 you need that kind of uh, assessment because of safety. And of course, AI is playing a slightly different role because uh, it has some components that are different than what we've seen before. So the idea is that hopefully we are making a contribution not only to check the risk, but also to help people to be aware and also be mindful. Now, I think that there are a couple of things that I would like to share with you that we come up with a catalog of questions that are very important every time you want to do a verification with somebody that is using or plan to use an AI just to make sure that you have a clear set expectation. So who requests an inspection? Why? And for whom is relevant? And since, you know, at the moment it is not required, there's no law, so we're going to be in this idea of recommended. Do you want to do a self-assessment or do you want to have external people doing it? Is the self-assessment really neutral or there's a Is that public? Is that to verify something or to uh, help some marketing? Or is that because you want to do the certification? At the moment, there is no certification in place. Maybe they will come in Europe in a couple of years. If it's illegal, if you find something illegal, like, you know, too much uh, conflict of interest in the company. So that's my opinion, although the European Commission is for the moment recommending self-assessment. So there's a checklist, you can check it out, but nobody's really checking how you verify the claims. Or oh, I'm ethical, I'm accurate. I'm With the company or the organization or with 
vendors of anything that you use for verifying tools, toolkits, framework, platform. So basically assessing that and also the bias between inspector is important because if you have a biased team, um, you also have a, a single view of thinking and it might be that your thinking is biased and is influencing the way you assess. But this is really an error that nobody has a solution, you know, how you verify that, but these are very important. upfront. Is it share? Kept private. If it's kept private, always ask yourself why you're keeping it private. There might be a couple of reasons why you want to keep it private. One, which is the intellectual property. So the company that has developed the software does not want to reveal their secrets. Perfectly legal, uh, because if they reveal their secrets, then the competitor could actually use it. But at the same time, if this is endangering the possibility to understand why certain results are done, that's a problem. Worse would be you keep in private because something is wrong. That's a bad thing. So that's when you start becoming unethical. And maybe you're perfectly legal. Because remember, legal and ethical are different things. And let me tell you, there is a lot of, uh, when you start looking at the context of an AI, it gets into property that are political and institutional that are very important. So just to make sure that we, we root it to some work. So from a Western perspective, our context of trust, ethics, and, and uh, is con always connected to democracy. So here is a quote from the, uh, the Data Ethics Commission of the Federal German Republic. It said, there is a need to really look if the fact can have an effect in function of democracy, fundamental rights, second, not to mention fundamental rights. So this is not only about being legal, but it's also about what it does in terms of democracy. You can follow the discussion about fine because, you know, for some reason, my colleagues, uh, they tend not to ask themselves this question. Sorry, sorry, Professor, we are having real trouble hearing you. The oh. audio is gone for like 30 seconds, then for 10 seconds back, oh. then 30 seconds gone. Oh, okay. So if you are using a Wi-Fi connection, maybe you can switch to your data uh, connection. Maybe your Wi-Fi is having trouble today. I, I don't use a Wi-Fi, but I'm actually using a... Um... You are on a wired connection, okay. I knew that, that because I knew about this problem. Okay, uh, so maybe your provider has not a very powerful network connected to Zoom. Well, let's see. I don't know, but let me know if you if you hear that uh, for some reason for a long time I'm I disappear. Let me know, and I can repeat. So, I... uh, yes, it, it's happened quite a lot during the <laughs> the presentation. I tried to to disable your camera, so my it's not helping. So. I don't know. Let's let's go on go on like this. Thank you. Okay. So basically, the, the, one of the big questions here is that if the AI that is taking really part in this context, and we call it this ecosystem, if the ecosystem where the AI is being de developed, deploy, or 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 used, is democratic or is following a debatable point, but I think, you know, it is a, it's an important question to ask in an assessment because it's very likely going to come soon when you have software being developed in different parts of the world and one has to make decision to what extent this software is embedded some ethical values that are not conformant to our, let's say, concept of human rights, for example. That, just to give an idea, 
when we work on AI, we really embed ethics value into the system. So we basically embed when we design and train this software, concept like good, bad, healthy, disease. And this is important because basically, and that's a quote from uh, somebody who works in this area here. In case the a, a AI is a medical device giving you a diagnosis, the AI has been trained to decide what is a disease. Because when you have a green, you are, you're good, or red, you have a problem and this is the problem. Somebody has set up in the training of this system an example and say, listen, from this moment on, this is supposed to be healthy and this is supposed to be a disease, you know, and maybe these people are not even expert in the domain and maybe they don't even understand that this has an implication on what is good or bad. Do I get a visa? I don't get a visa. Am I higher? I'm not higher. Do I get a credit from the bank? I don't get a credit from the bank. Am I healthy? I'm not healthy. And this is really becoming an important issue of accountability also. Who is responsible when decisions are made where there's a partnership, for example. This I already mentioned to you that it could be that the use of AI could also tend to consolidate concentration of power. That's a very political discussion, but again, you know, they also been mentioned by the, the Data Ethics Commission of the German federal government, because you know, when you look at it from a higher perspective, like uh, the development of what they call data economy, where of course AI is It's something that one has to very uh, uh, clearly look at in terms of the ethical implication, not to mention the political implication. So should this be an assessment? We think yes. Some people... is something that somebody is defining. So first thing to clarify when you work with a company who has done some uh, trademark on their work is what is your intellectual property? And how do you want to handle it if we want to assess if your software is good or not for societal, ethical, legal, technical implication? And this is likely gonna be a, a big uh, uh, issue because we might restrict the possibility for you to look at the software. And if it does, you need to understand to what extent you can then present some of the results because you are under very likely under non-disclosure. So this is an important thing. There's been a paper from Google, interesting, called Engaging Policy Shareholders on Issue in AI Governance that also is looking at this issue here. But obviously Google has uh, is one of the big player in this sense. There's a trade-off between disclosing what you do when you monitor some software and this uh, intellectual property. So when can you disclose? So we basically come up with this uh, do unethical things. So ethics is meant to improve the way um, business or things are done. Legal will set the things like useful to think of uh, the way we work in this way. So this is like a context.
country, it could be a city, it could be in Europe, it could be somewhere else. In this ecosystem, you have legal and uh, regulatory rules. So, for example, GDPR in Europe. So, if you are operating in Europe, and the results of whatever you are using with AI is in Europe, then you are under certain regulations that have been set. And this has to be taken into account. The second layer that has to be taken into account, no matter what you do with this AI, is if the organization has so-called contractual obligation. And maybe this is the high level values and you want to do the assessment of that. You have to take into account where you are. So what it means that an So I skip that. So just to give you a feeling of, you know, I don't want to get too technical because I have an hour, so then we have questions at the end. So the assessment in a nutshell is in three big blocks. First, we do a setup. Then when we finish the setup, we do a kind Just to be clear, when you start assembling a team, you understood that nobody can do it on your own, so you have to have a multidisciplinary team. Interesting enough that this is a, a quite a critical uh, decision. Who should be in this team? What background, what skills, what kind of background and, and inclination? Because the choice of the experts have an ethical implication. This is a interesting research area for some of you in social science that could basically look at how people that are supposed to be neutral experts validating something very complicated could influence the experiment. Something that people in physics knows as soon as you touch something, they change, but the people are important. Also, it's important to have a log that basically can be shared with whoever are the stakeholders to make sure that you have transparency. Not everybody likes that. So it might be that you are not allowed to do that because then a company might not want anything be disclosed because there might be something not positive about them. You see, this is also a discussion of by law, there is no uh, law, so you're not, so you're not required to do it. So in self-assessment is very unlikely that the company will be agree to do a, a, a shareable, transparent law for fear. What you assess? Are you assessing the software? and the relationship with the doctors and the patient, are you assembling how a department of a hospital is using this software for doing certain kinds of things? And we need to make sure that there's a clear definition of this boundary before you can start. Also, you know, how long you wanna assess? And there you know, various ways you can assess right now and say, because I think there are some risk right now, I just want to see now, or I want to assess because I think there will be risk in the future of what I have, or I want to have a, a planning assessment because that could be a challenge in the future when technology becomes even more advanced. So this is the, the part that you might be interested in because I understood that um, there are also people in social science. Um, how do you make a number of experts Very difficult. So, 
technical scenario. Social tech. Let me see. Yeah, the idea is that by analyzing social technical scenario, you're looking at people, human actors, you're looking at their expectation, you're looking at their interaction with this software. And these are scenarios you could say, okay, I have a self-driving boat that will be used in the Venice uh, Lagoon. This is not a joke. There is a project now in Amsterdam, in the port of Amsterdam, they are planning to use self-driving boats in the port. Now, who are the actors? What are the expectations? What are the interactions? So you come up with social technical scenarios so that you can eventually define what could be ethical issues that need to be verified. Now, when we say ethical tension or issue, it's always about pursuit of different value with respect to a technology. So it's not in a abstract way. And again, this is a, a nice paper that reflects that. You need to describe what, what, what are these ethical issues. And you have to understand, you know, if you have different terminology and different background, this is difficult. You need to reach consensus among experts of different backgrounds. So what we have done, we have uh, come up with a method to show to experts, and not all the experts are having an, an ethical background, some example of tensions. We took some example uh, from the Nuffield report, and these are some of the tensions. Because, you know, when you look at this accuracy versus fairness, accuracy versus explainability, and you go down and maybe on things like... Uh, personalization versus solidarity or convenience versus dignity. I'm sure that half of you will not know what this means. This you might have a feeling, fair, accuracy, privacy, you might have a feeling, transparency, you might have a feeling, but most of the people have different interpretations. So what we give them, we need to solve the ambiguity that we have because we have different terminology, different discipline and different culture. So. We use something called concept building, which is an attempt to make everybody on the same page. And you can try to have these people talking the same, uh, using the same term so that you can then say, I have a problem. There is this kind of uh, ethical issue. And then you map it into a particular case. Let me give you an example. So with this, I can finish because I see that I have seven minutes um, just to give an idea of what we are talking about. So the first case study was an AI for predicting cardiovascular risk. So cardiovascular risk disease are a big cause of death in the war. So, you know, anything that is basically um, helping to non-invasive, so you don't have to do any invasive test. And it's basically an AI medical device. You see, this is already very important. This is defined as a medical device. Here is a, is a catch. In Europe, this, this, you have levels of uh, uh, medical device. This was level one, non-invasive, low risk. You don't have to do any clinical trial. So you can sell a product without doing any clinical trial. Not possible if you're level two and above when you have uh, um, invasive things. But this is a, a loophole in the, in the law because it allows a company to go out on the market without having tested on clinical trial. Ethical signal. They go to a cloud where there is a so-called weak classifier that is an ensemble of 
classifiers or some machine learning software. And they claim, they claim that this is better than an ECG. You have to understand that the 100% uh, the, the secure test is is good or bad to use this into the ethical uh, consideration of the EU. I'm only reading one because then you get a feeling. And this is the, uh, the it, we define the issue with the descriptive and narrative. So for example, when this AI is being used in screening asymptomatic people, so people that seem to be quite good, and they are notified with a minor problem. For example, they get, they have green, you good, red, after the notification. So how you map it to an ethical value? Well, respect for human autonomy. You respect whether you are deciding or not what to do. But also it's prevention of harm because this could be harming you because you get worried and you change your lifestyle. So from these two ethical requirements, high level, then you go to the requirements, the seven, and you come up with things like technical robust and safety accuracy. How accurate is this thing? And this is where the assessment starts. You go from the descriptive and you need to agree. You map it to a framework, which is defined by this tr trustworthy. And you end up having parts that need to be assessed. Let me show you another one so you get an idea this one here. So suppose that if test more patients with minor cardiovascular problems are being notified, meaning that it's not very accurate, and sent to a cardiologist. Well, this might imply two things, and you end up doing a unnecessary angiography, so ethical issue prevention of harm, but also, this is very expensive, so you give unnecessary cost for society because it's, you, you are spending money when it's not necessary. This also has an impact on society at large. And now there is a so-called ethical tension between human agency, um, I have to decide whether I want to do this or not, and the social cost. But I think what I want to mention that I skip a few things that when you have something like this, which is basically this is your, your AI, somebody has done the AI in some place, is embedded into a device, then you use in it, maybe the cloud, and then the output is seen by a doctor or whatever, and you're making a decision. When you start analyzing all of that, you have to understand what do I analyze, only the software or I analyze the whole thing. And obviously the interaction between all these actors is very important because the interaction now between these become affected by the software. There's a bias between a patient and the doctor. Patient and the doctor, they receive an information that he trusts or might not trust. The patient might trust the information or might ask for an information and the doctor might not be able to give an information because this is a black box. So having said that, and I'm skipping that because, you know, there's one important thing that we have learned, at least in the healthcare domain, when you have claims, oh, my software is accurate. My software works for any kind of uh, people. 
But wait, the heart is different by race. This is known. So the heart is not the same for Caucasian people and African American people or Asian people. So how does it work your product? Does it work well even in different parts of the world? Oh, well, we use electrical signal. Electrical signals are the same all over the place, but this, the position of the heart, the size of the heart is not. Then you start having to develop an evidence base against the claim, which is typically done in, in other domains, like you know, when somebody's claiming my nuclear reactor is safe. But here we have a slightly different thing because you know the software is, is slightly different. So it's very important, and that's a lesson we learn. Who is supposed to give a neutral evidence base? That's very important, very ethical, because we, once you have defined what is like peer review papers or whatever, then you can basically say, listen, there is no evidence that your system that is pretending to be accurate for all kinds of people, but it's been trained only for people uh, in hospital in, in one particular area, works also in other areas. So you have a risk. And basically, um, I, unfortunately, I don't have the time, but if you're interested, somebody view is technical, I'm interested if you have a question to go back to the idea how you define fairness from philosophy up to machine learning, because I think it's quite interesting. But I want to finish by saying that Presented and then has to be handled as such. Or anything else is basically not an ethical dilemma, but it could be that you don't have enough. And when basically this free is appropriate to use, or maybe you should change something. Mm, something is not really good, do something to do remedies or redress, absolutely no goal to use it. Um, a word of warning, there might be resistance in doing that. You know, you can imagine that and uh, basically see whether there's any question or um, if anybody wants to have uh, any conversation. So I think that's basically where I am at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I must say that I'm, I'm afraid there has been more than one time when the voice went. So uh, there might be a lot of questions for clarification. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I saw that sometimes the, 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 uh, I had a, a display say internet connection unstable, but yeah. I can't do much about it, so. Yeah, but, but, but at least we could read uh, yeah. on the slides, etc. but sometimes there's, um, well, I'm sure there'll be lots of um, questions um, for clarification or, or, or comments. Perhaps I'll just ask you to elaborate on one of the things you've talked about, just because I thought it was the, the, the distinction you made between the notion of trust and the notion of ethics right at the beginning. So it's a very basic question, but um, I, I suppose it could be very relevant to a lot of the uh, fields in the humanities and the social sciences. Um, how, how exactly did you? Do you distinguish the two perspectives? Because at some point it seemed as if um, trust was a matter of committing to something, whereas ethics was more societal values. But I, I, I'd be interested in you uh, telling us a bit more about that and how, how do you Sure, think sure. Um, so let me just uh, maybe uh, clarify. Um, we we're 
not interested in getting into a theoretical discussion about what is trust, what is ethics, what is ethical, what is legal. You know, we left it to people that are more qualified than us. And also they had the, the level of being influencing at the level of government. So basically we follow, uh, we follow the discussion and then eventually we make a strategic decision to basically say, well, rather than doing our own concept, and you can actually have the concept like here, one can say, well, I think I, like, I want to pick up something here. Maybe I want this. Voice goes again. <laughs> We've lost you again, or at least I've lost you again. Bad. That's too bad. Connection is bad. <laughs> so I, wa I wanted to say, if you are able to, to hear me in between, that we didn't want to get into the discussion of what are the principle, and we follow what the European Commission has decided to define. And the interesting thing is that they started from ethic apply ethics, which is this one here, but then they voice lost again. Hello. Yes. Uh, we're back. Back. We're back. But we <laughs> lost a little bit of the um, of the answer. Yeah, well, the answer was that the, the decision that the U.S. made with this group was to look not only of the issue, or again, the internet unstable, it's not ethical only, but it also has to be legal and technically robust. And when they come up with these seven requirements, you can see this is a mix. This is no more like, you know, you go from technical things where people need to look at that, but if you look at, for example, this one here, societal environmental well-being, this is a completely different space. So they come up with a catalog and they make their own destination of trust work. Of course, you can spend years or discuss what is trust. There's a lot of being research and, and you know better than me, social science is working on, on trust and, and there's a lot of study. But eventually when you have to apply you need some kind of requirements that you can somehow, and that's the difficult part because you cannot always measure, but at least you can present to what extent, for example, some of this, uh, for example, let's assume it's totally technically safe, but it's not fair. So what do you do, you see? Or it's totally um, clear that the AI is not overruling the person, but maybe what it does is endangering democracy because, you know, is so, or who is accountable? And that's also a very important thing. So when something goes wrong and the AI was part of the process of decision, who's accountable? The designer, the vendor, the person that gave permission to use the AI, the person that does finally the uh, decision, there's a big area and also AI is not the same in domain. You know, a self-driving car is different than a device for predicting cancer. So these are all the big questions that are, are now on the table. There's a lot of work in trying to give a definition what could be a trust, tr how can I trust this software? And this is the best attempt that you has made and we didn't question it. Of course, one can say, okay, I don't like it. But then what is the alternative? Then you need to look at uh, the even work from OECD, you know, which is bigger. And you have uh, the Beijing principle, the California principle. But then, then you can ask yourself, would I want to have a system develop into a particular place We've lost you again. The connection's gone again for a while, but... 
So I don't know if you if you heard the, no. the last part of the answer, but that not, was, the la not the very last. <laughs> no, the very last is basically saying that it, that was for us a decision, so that when we say we assess, we have a list of framework that is being a list created in Europe, and it will become maybe a law. Oh, so, well, anyway, that's, 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 no, it's a. A fascinating enterprise, surely. Uh, we do have a question in the chat um, from Maria Casanovo, Casalinovo. She asks, could you repeat how you overcome the gap between principle and practice? Big questions today. <laughs> the, uh, so, um, basically, what we did is rather than stay here only, we basically say, okay, what does it mean to be ethical, robust, and lawful? So when we analyze, we map what one could see, but let's assume somebody, an expert in ethics and, and healthcare, and he said, I think there is a problem of uh, human oversight. Then we map it here and we look clearly that this is an area to look at. Or maybe there is an issue that has to do with fairness. And fairness, I don't know if you want, I can give an example how to navigate fairness from philosophy down to machine learning. I don't know if we have time or if you yes, think, sure. it's sure. think it's useful. Okay, yes. So let, let me just go there because that's a good example. I skip it because I, we didn't have time, but um, let me just, I mean, this is, a, I think that is answering the, the, the question in a more specific way. Here we are. So let me just uh, do like that. Okay. Now you should see the big screen again. Oops. Sorry. This is the big screen is actually sorry. It is coming to the place that I want to be, which is here. Mm, yeah. Okay, so this is actually one of the things. So suppose that you are interested in analyzing not sure that it is really accurate for all kinds of people. So now you're stuck. Okay. Now, basically, what do you the first step is to clarify what kind of definition fairness is the most important for the domain? So in healthcare, for example, because in the ethical value of fairness, you can have a several definitions. Then you have to map it to the healthcare. So in healthcare, what is considered to be fair? And you might discuss, you know, the uh, experts might come up with Lost you again. We've lost your voice again. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Experts might come up with is the last thing I heard. <laughs> uh, okay, so basically. Oh no. Gone again. No, it's Sorry. <laughs> if you look at this terminology here, I'm sure that most of you will be lost because you know if you're not expert in 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 the in the machine learning thing, these are just numbers. But each of these numbers is basically telling one possible way of defining what is fair. And basically, here is the big question: What is the type of fairness? that is appropriate for this particular application. And this is not only for machine learning people or for the clinical people or only for the philosopher or the ethical reason is all combined because this is quite complex and there are trade-offs. So there's typically trade-off where you can have them all. So, and if you decide that something is fair, it might not be what you want in this application. I don't know if you answered the question, but at least that's an attempt. 
Are there any other questions or comments? Um, any other requests for clarification? Could we explain a little bit more because your voice went off in that particular slide, the layered stuff that you illustrated before, the layered, I don't know, it was method protocol. There was a slide with a pyramid, the, same, the title. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. The pyramid, okay. Let me just go to the pyramid. Um, so let's go here. When you're here, the, the first thing you need to define where are you when you assess something and what is your boundary. So this is not easy. So basically we come up with this pyramid, which basically say, okay, let's assume I have a hospital in Modena. All right, so where is Modena? Modena is in the city of Modena, is in Italy, is in Europe. So I am probably under certain regulation. For example, GDPR. So I'm using data of people. Well, I cannot really do what I want with the data. I have a law. So that there's not something that I can decide and there's something legally binding. So if my AI for some reason is using the data of personal data in, in a not correct way, then I can verify against the law. Then I can say, okay, well, maybe the hospital is under a certain region and there are certain contractual obligations. For example, let's assume that you are supposed to uh, uh, display to any patient in the last uh, 10 days uh, some of the finding of some laboratory exam, something like that. So anything like that. So if this is a contra, it has to be respected. So this is the context. When you start coming and say, okay, is this AI that I'm using radiology good for this hospital? Then it's not good in, in China, it's good here. So this is basically the place. And, and what values do I want? Well, in our case, we take the trustworthy AI. So the trustworthy AI is just a checklist on paper. Then you want to operationalize it and take into account where you are and your environment. So this is just for us to clarify that we don't start from scratch. We start from a place where it has its own regulation. We lost you again around the place with its own regulations. Oh, now we are back. So I don't, know, I don't know what you lost. I mean, I wanted to- A place with its own regulations. <laughs> okay. I wanted to say that this helps when you start the assessment to say, okay, this is what is given. And this is a self-assessment that you can do. And of course, there's a lot of interaction because uh, this part here is different if you are in Europe, if you already go to the United States, already this level of, for example, of data protection is not the same. So, and, and uh, depending on where you are, you might have different laws and different regulation or the institution the, or, or whatever, the context where the institution is using the AI might have different legal and contractual obligations. So that helps only to fix the thing. And it's actually used here at the very beginning when we say, okay, what do we want to assess? And then we start the assessment. Hopefully that was at least, at least uh, under, uh, understood till the very end. I see that somebody. Almost. <laughs> Almost. Um, oh, Sonia is asking new regulation or or on recommendation. I don't know exactly if the question is new regulation or recommendation or new regulation on recommendation. So maybe Sonia, you might want to clarify. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Oh. 
Yeah. Okay. Now I can. <laughs> it is terrible to be muted all the for all the presentation. No, no. My question is related to the new law, uh, which is under development uh, in EU in UE, and it is related to recommendation softwares and uh, on the basis of the collected data because I know that it is very dangerous uh, this operation of uh, the big companies that are profiling people. I have heard that there is new, this new uh, advancement in uh, regulating the use of private, private, private data. So my question is, do you know something about this uh, new idea for uh, for uh, preserving the privacy of uh, the privacy of people in Europe? Um, I, I heard about it, but I don't have um, more details. What we have done, we, we have created an advisory board and uh, in our advisory board, we also have one of the key uh, person that was behind GDPR. So when we have a question like this, we can ask, for example, Paul Nemitz, that is actually one of the key person. And I can ask him and then I can, ans I can answer the question by asking our advisor because I don't know this, answer, this question. Okay. I have a second question. Uh, obviously I see your, um, obviously I agree on this uh, transparency and of the algorithm because we have uh, techniques that are black box <laughs> and so it's very very dangerous but uh, um, we have to stress more on the quality of data because everything is starting from the quality of data and many people using these AI algorithms does not understand what is the relevance of the data set you are collecting and you are using. So I don't know if you have some uh, uh, suggestion uh, for these, uh, for stressing more, because I think it is the most important uh, starting point. Um, let me just uh, go back to what the, the AI is asking. So let me see uh, here. This will, this will be here. Yes. So this is important. So this is already an important element of what is trustworthy. Now, the interesting thing is that they didn't put a weight or a scoring if this is more important than, for example, this, or this, or this. So basically they say, I have seven requirements. They're very different, these requirements, you know, because for example, here, if you need to do an assessment on societal well-being or sustainability, you have to go through a completely different way of assessing, which is done by UN, by the Charter of Europe. So, and it goes into a space which is totally not technical. Here it is basically looking specifically of how do I guarantee that the data is of good quality or integrity. So I don't have a specific uh, a suggestion because we're not really trying to develop solution. In fact, if somebody has good solution for verifying or filtering that, we're gonna use it. We are basically um, addressing this problem. Um, I would say that the data is one part of the problem, but the other part of the problem is the people that de design the system do have a bias sometimes. And they can choose example of training data on purpose or, or, or not on purpose because the data may be, and at the end, you know, it's not clearly wh where is the problem. So then you have a connection between this and this. Yes. There's a clear connection. And also who was involved in the decision. So 
if at the end it's just a young developer with a manager that doesn't really know anything about ethics, then you may end up having a decision of using something like this that is transparent and it might actually end up being unfair. So you see, they're all connected. So that's what I wanted to say that, and also then if something goes wrong, who's accountable? Mm -hmm. You know, and you can see many examples and this is why it's so complicated because each of this is related to each other, but it's so different, you know, think about it. This can only be verified by a technical person. Nobody okay. will be able, a philosopher won't be able to verify if you are resilient to an attack. But when you start being in this place. Yes. <clears throat> Definitely very different perspective uh, and an interplay between different perspectives. Are there any other questions or comments? Not in the chat for the moment, but perhaps directly from any of the participants. One new message, yes. <laughs> will the slides be available on Dolly or will the slides be available for? Um, oh, okay, no, I can, send, I can send you the PDF of the slides so that you can put Thank it you. on your website. So I'm Thank happy you very to. Much. But also I can send you a link of a recording that has no interruption. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you can place that one because this recording is likely not be of good quality. Mm -hmm. So if you want, you, you can use another uh, link. It's not the same, it's a similar lecture, but I think it was no interruption. I don't know why this time it was so many interruptions. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll... And I see that somebody was asking, actually, Leonardo Sanna, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. explainability is a priority. Um, well, listen, explainability, explainability or explicability has been added as an ethical principle. So this is not being considered an ethical principle before, you know, basically all the bioethics does not have that. They have maybe something like uh, do good, which is not here. So maybe, you know, here you have prevention of harm. Uh, and so having started with that, then obviously when you have the requirements that are here, then you have it here. But this is one of the, of the uh, there's a bit interesting discussion. So I'm, I'm throwing you a research area. Suppose you are in healthcare and suppose you are a doctor and suppose that the software that uh, uh, vendor X is giving you is very good. It's very accurate. It works perfectly well, but you cannot explain it. So the doctor does not understand how it works, but it works. So now is a big question. In this area of the requirements, explainability would be zero. So it would be a minus on trustworthy. The big question, I, I've started to see some people uh, writing papers about that. Do you need to understand everything that works? Or, and this also is very important for this part because you know you have to then have a patient that gives your consent. The patient gives you consent because he signed something that, and he, he should be explainable. And then there's an accountability. So you see, these are three areas that are very connected and there is not an obvious solution. So when they write that, they didn't write it for a domain. So this has to be tailored to a domain. And then I think you will have these requirements being adjusted by domain. In, in the financial sector will probably be different. In healthcare would be different, transportation would be different. So this is the interesting thing to work on, on best practices because then you start seeing all these differences. And 
experts because before I thought that a cardiology was an expert and then we had somebody in our team is a professor of public health and he basically said, and he works on evidence-based medicine, okay? And in this big Lost again. lost you again it's also how you communicate it you know between the doctors and the patient or in the website <sighs> and we're back we lost all the last part about the cardiologist. Ah, <laughs> the cardiologist. Uh, but we are fine with <laughs> our <laughs> health. <laughs> with the cardiologist in our team, when we were uh, asking experts um, if the device was a, uh, uh, the claim of the vendors were good, we asked the cardiologist. And then we had in our team somebody who was a professor of public health that works in evidence-based medicine. So in evidence-based medicine, we believe cardiologists are biased and they shouldn't give evidence. I said, okay, you see, I'm learning something new. There's a tension even between the discipline. So who is supposed to give a neutral evidence? Because a claim can be only verified against an evidence. So that's a, that's a very interesting um, lesson learned and we're learning constantly by doing case study. Okay. Well, are there any other questions or comments? We can take a last one if um, you like. We're already... We have reached 3.30. Well, if there's no other question or comment, let me thank Professor Vickery very much for being um, with us. Uh, he has left us with some curiosity <laughs> to, to learn more and to think more about this. And we'll be grateful if you... Um, Yes, if you send your slides or, or, or link to um, the other talk that we can then use for, a, uh, for more reflection. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. Also, thank you, Sonia, that did the, the connection. Um, I will certainly send you a PDF of the file and I send you a link of a presentation that had not so many interruptions so that at least you can follow <laughs> the arguments. <laughs> And, and if you have questions, you can send them to me by email. I'm happy to uh, give some answer. If I answer to all the questions. Again, <laughs> Roberto, <laughs> again. <laughs> you have been interrupted again, <laughs> very shortly. Okay. So please, <laughs> okay. fix your connection. <laughs> well, it depends, it depends on who is the connection, but there are so many people connected, but anyway. So. No, 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 because it's uh, Zoom uh, holds a lot of connections. The problem is uh, your home connection. I, I yeah, think. probably probably we have uh, an issue at the moment. But anyway, so thank you for inviting yeah. me. I was saying that I'll send the PDF of the file okay. and maybe a link of a, of a recording that was with no interruption. And if you have a question or some of the participants have you can send them to me by email. And, and I say, I don't promise answer because some of the <laughs> issues are really with not an answer, but I'm happy to even provide you from resources or other things and we could keep in touch. Okay. Ciao Roberto, grazie.